Where should we be putting factories in space? Is the Milky Way losing stars? Did Webb give us a larger observable universe? And what comes after the International Space Station? All this and more in this week's question show. It's time for the question show your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel, question pops in your brain, just write them down, I will gather them up and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Red Wizard. Where would be the best place in the solar system to build an unmanned space based factory shipyard that could produce the infrastructure needed for mass exploration of the solar system, if you could harvest everything it needed from to operate from the local environment. So I always say that gravity wells are for suckers. And so if you're down at the bottom of a gravity well, you're having to pay the terrible price of launching everything off of the surface of the planet out into space. And in that case, you know, we're talking about launching stuff off of the surface of the Earth. And so if you really like in the far, far future, if you want to have a proper solar system spanning civilization, where we are moving from world to world, and we're building up this infrastructure, we've got the belters, we've got the people living on Mars, and so on, the best resource that we're going to want to be able to take advantage of are the asteroids. And there's the asteroid belt, which is in between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter, but that's pretty far away. And they're actually fairly difficult to get to the resource that is probably the most easy to get to are the near Earth asteroids. And these are the asteroids that cross the orbit of the Earth or get or in some cases come close to crossing the orbit of the Earth. And these are the dangerous asteroids, right? These are the ones that have the potential for crashing into our planet. But also, they're made of juicy, juicy metals that we could harvest and use to then continue on and explore the rest of the solar system. And so when scientists when rocket scientists think about the exploration of the solar system, they don't so much think about distance as they think about delta v the change in velocity that's required to go to a place. And so for example, if you're down here on the surface of planet Earth, and you want to get up into low Earth orbit, it's about seven and a half kilometers per second of delta V. In other words, you have to change, you have to have enough propellant on board to change your velocity from zero to 7.5 kilometers per second. And that's the delta V. And you might think that okay, well, so the next thing that's easiest to get to is the moon, but it's not. There are actually near Earth asteroids that require dramatically less delta V to get to. And the one that's probably the lowest is just shy of six kilometers per second of delta V. And that's just one of them. There are probably hundreds that are sort of in that range between six and 10 kilometers per second of delta V. And that is relatively easy to get to once you're already out in orbit around the Earth, you can get out to one of these asteroids and then set up your 3d printers, your facilities for harvesting material off of the surface of the asteroid. But the other advantage to going to these asteroids is that then you need to be able to eject this material off into space. And that's where being on an asteroid provides you with even better uh, advantage. And that is because you you're dealing with the gravity in some cases, the escape velocity of asteroids is measured in hundreds of meters per second, you know, with Earth, it's seven and a half, actually, the, you know, when I'm talking about getting just into low Earth orbit, that's the 7.6 actually escape the Earth's orbit It's more like 11, I think. And so to get off of a lot of asteroids is measured in 10s of meters of delta V hundreds of meters of delta V. And so you could put a rail gun or, you know, some kind of electromagnetic launcher onto the surface of the asteroid. And then you just start crunching up the asteroid, tossing it into this electromagnetic launcher, hurling the material off into space, catching it, um, and then using it in your space factories to build your spacecraft, your rovers, whatever you need. And then the other thing is really interesting. And, and this is newer understanding of the composition of the inner solar system is that there actually is a surprising amount of volatiles of water of various types of you know, nitrogen, various kinds of gases mixed in with the asteroids, you know, with a lot of the sample return missions that have come home, they've found that in fact, there is more material inside these asteroids than we thought we would think that okay, they're too close to the sun, they're getting heated up all of this volatile material is getting blasted off into space. But in fact, 
once you get just a little bit below the surface of the asteroid, there's a lot more material that you could use. And so there's the stuff that you would need for propellants and so on. And so, you know, you ask, like, what is the best place to build this factory? It's going to be on the a near Earth asteroid that takes the littlest amount of delta V to reach and also has the lowest gravity escape velocity for you to be able to get material off of that asteroid and out into space to the games regarding our position in the Milky Way. Do we lose planets, stars, etc. from the Milky Way? And how does it happen? So there are absolutely stars, planets, various material that is escaping from the Milky Way and astronomers have identified a bunch of these. They call them hyper velocity stars. And these stars are moving at the Milky Way's escape velocity. And a lot of these stars were discovered with the Gaia spacecraft. And so Gaia is doing this you know, giant survey of all of the nearby stars in the galaxy. And it takes an image from one side of the Earth's orbit and then takes an image from the other side of the Earth's orbit and then uses parallax, you know, where you sort of you know, go back and forth with your eyes to measure the distance to the star. But also they can measure the redshift, the direction that the star is moving and its velocity. And most of the time stars are just kind of drifting around past each other and it's all very slow. But every now and then they find these stars that are just hurtling on escape trajectories. And you might wonder, like, how could a star be on an escape trajectory leaving the solar system? And the answer is we kind of don't know. There's a couple of mechanisms that are probably happening. So one possibility is that you had a star ejected after its binary partner detonated as a supernova. So imagine you've got these binary stars that are orbiting a common center of gravity. One is a very massive star that is at the end of its life. It puffs up as a red supergiant, and then it detonates as a supernova. And the other star was trapped in this sort of binary orbit with it, and now is released into space. And away it goes kind of like a slingshot. The other possibility is that stars fall down close to the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, and then encounter some kind of three body interaction with maybe another black hole, and they get kicked out again, sort of like a gravitational slingshot, and they are leaving the galaxy and they're never coming back. And one of the things that's really interesting is that astronomers think that there are stars that are on these uh, escape trajectories from Andromeda. And there are ones that are on escape trajectories from the Milky Way. And then in fact, we probably have swapped stars with Andromeda and maybe other nearby galaxies. So uh, so yeah, now planets, same thing, you know, if they get you know, planets would be even easier. Now, I don't know if the star, if it got ejected, would be able to bring its planets along with it if, if the process is just so extreme that the planets might get torn away when the stars begins this journey out of the solar system. But yeah, stars are leaving the Milky Way. Robert Oliver 7985. Did James Webb enlarge the observable universe? No. Now, James Webb is the most powerful space telescope that humanity has ever built. It is seven times larger than the Hubble Space Telescope. It has the ability to take images that would take Hubble a day. It can do it in less than an hour. It's unbelievably powerful and sensitive, and especially being able to see the most distant regions of the universe. But in fact, James Webb can't see beyond what is the sort of fundamental limit to what we can see in the universe, and that is the beginning of the universe. So at the very beginning of the universe is the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is a time when the universe had cooled down that it was essentially the surface of a star and then it became uh, transparent, light was able to escape out into the universe and it has been traveling for the entire age of the universe to get to us. And so the problem is that you can't see beyond this cosmic microwave background radiation because you know, before that was the very beginning, the Big Bang. And up until that point, it was entirely opaque. And so like, imagine you're in fog. And around you, you can see out to a certain point, And then beyond that, you can't see anymore. And so even if you're in an open field, or whether you were in a dense city, if you're surrounded by fog, you can't tell what's what's out there. And that's sort of what it's like with James Webb. And so the problem is not how far Webb could see if light traveled instantaneously, then Webb could see much, much farther than it currently can. The problem is, is that there was no universe at an earlier time. 
And so really that is the farthest we can see is the earliest that we can see. Gabser Sarg, do rockets pollute a lot, specifically the ones by Elon Musk? So do rockets pollute? Yes, rockets are often fueled with hydrocarbon fuel. So for example, the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, it's fueled by kerosene. It is airline fuel, the same smell that you get when you're sitting in an airplane. That is the smell that you would have if you were close to Falcon 9. And that is the same rocket fuel that was used by the Saturn V. Now the space shuttle used liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And when those burn the they release water vapor. And so while water vapor can be a cause of greenhouse gases, it's not very polluting. So in fact, using liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen is a is a greener fuel than um, than kerosene is. With the upcoming Starship, they're using methane and and methane is another hydrocarbon, the kind of thing that you know, is a byproduct of oil and gas refining. But you can also make methane uh, just purely just by pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and mixing it with water and creating methane. And so it's entirely possible that you could have a giant solar panel array sitting by the in Boca Chica where the starships are flying, and it is using solar power. And I, I did the math that you need about uh, a third of an acre of solar panels to generate enough electricity to uh, create the flow to be able to produce methane fuel for Starship. And then you would just be pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, mixing it with water, producing methane, storing in giant tanks. And over time, you would end up with uh, a fuel that is carbon neutral. Now, this is not what they do today, right? Like they buy methane from the methane store and they pump it into the rockets and they fly it and they are um, definitely producing uh, greenhouse gases. But when you think about the fact that one starship flies every few months compared to the amount of cars that people drive, the amount of air, you know, flights that people take on airplanes, the amount of cargo that is moved across the sea with giant boats with diesel engines and so on. There's tremendous number of sources of of greenhouse gases and carbon emissions and, and rocketry today is a teeny tiny fraction of the greenhouse gases that are produced. But if we get to a place where you have multiple rockets that are launching every day from multiple launch sites, then it is going to start to add up. And so I hope that when that happens, that the various rocket companies will move towards this renewable version of with carbon capture to actually make their rocket fuel. If you want to support the work we do at Universe Today, consider joining our Patreon club. Your support lets us have a minimum of ads and no sponsorship messages. Patrons get no ads on universetoday.com for life. Want the extra parts of the live stream that aren't in this edited version? You can sign up for a special patron-only podcast feed and get the overtime segments as well as other special behind-the-scenes episodes, including our monthly patron-only question show. Thanks to everyone who has already subscribed and welcome to our recent newcomers. Pooh, Jeremy Brunn. Lawrence Federico, David Kant, Cheryl, and Lucy the Stargazer. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. LL, do you support building a new space station after 20 years from now? The International Space Station, which has been orbiting around the Earth for uh, about 25 years now, and it's been permanently inhabited, which is incredible. But it is getting old and it's requiring more and more maintenance. And NASA and the Russian Space Agency have decided that they want to spend their money on other things. And so they're planning on bringing the space station down probably by around 2030. And if no replacement is made, then the only space station that's going to be in orbit is going to be the Chinese space station. And they're fairly new into the process. And so they'll probably be running their station, you know, into the 2030s, maybe all the way to 2040 ish. Um, now, there are various companies who are proposing to build a private space station. Uh, Axiom Space is planning to attach a module to the International Space Station and then detaching it when it's time to destroy the space station or remain in orbit. There's a company that's called Haven that's building space station. There's a whole bunch of companies that have proposed of building these uh, private space stations. And who knows? Maybe one of these companies will get the funding, launch the space 
station and have enough paying tourists or scientific missions going to it to maintain it. You know, like a lot, we report on a lot of these, these planned space stations, but my experience as a space journalist is reporting on them going out of business. Uh, you know, for those of you who are watching now, I, I could begin listing off dozens of companies that went out of business before your time. Uh, and their plan was to do asteroid mining or private flights to the moon or uh, building private space stations. You know, probably the big, biggest example of this is Bigelow Aerospace. You know, they're the people that pioneered this idea of building giant inflatable space stations. There's a Bigelow module that was attached to the International Space Station. And so, you know, they got contracts with NASA and yet they went bankrupt. And now they're not going to do all of their plans. And so I think there are a bunch of companies and they have hardware in the works and they're planning to build these things. But it's one thing to get a bunch of investors to to give you some seed funding to start building your space station. And it's another thing to actually build the station, launch it up, maintain it, uh, deal with various crises as they show up, uh, you know, take paying passengers to your space station. So you know, do I support it? Yes, I think that we should have we should always have an inhabited station that is orbiting around the Earth, we should have an inhabited station that is on the surface of the moon. We should have a station or two on an asteroid and we should have a station on Mars. Like these are, these are the things, these are the places we should go that we have scientific questions about and we should maintain a presence in all of those places. And so I personally think that not having a space station is a big mistake that, you know, taking your eye off that ball and shifting to the moon and then who knows if the goals are going to change and maybe we're going to go to Mars. Like, like at a certain point, you end up with no human presence in space anymore. And I think that would be bad. So uh, I hope that by the time the International Space Station is going to be deorbited, there are concrete plans to have something else that's going to be there, whether it's government or whether it's private, whether it's a collaboration from a bunch of nations. Uh, you know, it would be too bad if there really was no accessible space station in space, uh, apart from the Chinese one. But you know, and if maybe if the Chinese open up and let anybody come to their station, that would be great. But but for now, it's a sort of fairly private affair. So so yeah, I support more space stations. Chris P. Bacon, what is your personal belief that caused or came before the Big Bang? So I think it's really important to understand what your limitations are as in my case, a journalist, right? I am not a scientist, I'm a journalist. And so um, although people have proposed lots of different interesting ideas of what what might have come before the Big Bang, you know, maybe there was another universe, maybe it's a cyclical universe, maybe the universe has always existed, maybe the universe was in this really hot, dense state forever. And then for some reason, it triggered the beginning of the formation of the universe, maybe this universe is formed from a universe that appeared within another universe. Um, maybe we're inside a black hole. Um, you know, maybe the idea of inflation of internal inflation with universes popping all over the place and then membranes uh, colliding with each other and creating laws of physics within those universes. I mean, these are all possibilities they have all been said and people have have proposed them and there are plenty of papers where people talk about them and argue about them. But the reality is that we have no evidence. And, uh, you know, my role as a journalist is to is to just report on what is the scientific consensus. And, you know, I, I say this before I begin the question show, but it doesn't make it into the show. And so, you know, maybe people don't catch this, but but, you know, I don't have opinions about this kind of thing. Um, I am not equipped. I am not educated enough to know whether something is more true or not. Um, and I think this is this is an issue. Like I think a lot of people they listen to a charismatic science communicator who is explaining a certain idea or theory. And because you like the way that they explain it or present it, then it feels reasonable, right? That you're like, Oh, yeah, he explained what came before the universe. And I really like his explanation. And therefore, uh, he's probably right. And this is the one that I'm going to take on as my own personal belief for where the universe came from. But there is no scientific consensus. But if there is a scientific consensus, and somebody is charismatic, and they're saying things that are kind of against the mainstream, the safe bet 
is to trust the scientific consensus to, to assume that if, you know, a thousand scientists have all done the work and they've all done the math and they've um, gotten to the point where they understand each other's work and they've critiqued it and argued about it, argued about it, and they've tried to tear each other's ideas apart. And the ones that remain are the ones that are, you know, begrudgingly agreed to as probably the best case by most scientists. That is the one that we as lay people should just, you know, the short version, the shortcut, the power move is to accept the scientific consensus. And, you know, there's a great quote, and I, I wish I knew who had said this, but like, if you want to understand or have an opinion about one of these scientific matters, the best thing that you can do is to put yourself through enough education that you understand you've done the work to be able to understand the theory to the same level as the scientists. Go get your undergrad degree, go get your master's degree, then do your PhD, then do your postdoc, then put in all the research and write original papers and go to the conferences and get yourself to this place where you understand the science as well as the scientists. Then you are in a place where you can objectively evaluate the scientific theories that you are looking at. But if you can't do that, then the second best thing is to trust somebody who just did somebody who did just go through all of the undergrad, got their master's degree, got their, their PhD, did their postdoc, actually did clinical trials, actually spent time using a telescope, designed a spacecraft, um, uh, evaluated rocks that came from the bottom of the ocean, uh, counted bugs in the middle of the Amazon rainforest and built climate models that are predicting the future of the earth. Uh, and you know, there are going to be plenty of people who are going to tell you, you should listen to me. You should, you should believe what I tell you. And they're going to make a compelling case and they're going to try to sway your opinion and your opinion should remain unswayed that you should be like, well, line up all the scientists who agree with you and line up all the scientists who disagree with you. And I will take the scientists who, you know, who agree with you or do disagree with you, like wh whichever is more for now, that is going to be my provisional, uh, belief until the scientific consensus changes. And obviously the scientific consensus can be wrong. Um, but just in general, it's the safe bet to go with the scientific consensus. So when people ask me what I think about things, you know, I've, I, sorry, I hit you with a rant, Chris. Um, but, um, you know, when people ask me what, what is my opinion about this theory or that theory, I don't have one. I am, I try to remain as neutral as I can until things start to, uh, move into areas that I have more experience with, like reporting on companies going out of business who are attempting to build space stations. So, uh, I, <laughs> I hope that helps. I have no opinion and I don't think anybody does either. There is no scientific consensus about what came before the universe. So let's just find out and wait for that scientific consensus to show up and enjoy the mystery and enjoy as the, as the, as people go back and forth with different ideas and argue and write papers and, and come up with new theories and overturn them and seek evidence. And eventually somebody will come up with an answer. All right, those are the questions that we had this week. Thank everyone who watched the show live, gave us the questions, everyone who put their questions into the YouTube comments. I really enjoy this. Now, I'm going to talk about sort of our changed schedule, but first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Andrew M. Gross, Barry Lake Roofing, David Gilton, and David Matz, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Paul Rohrbach, Spiderswap.io, and Stephen Filer Munley, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So this week, we tried the first new recording time for the question show, the European time stream. And that was, for me, 8 in the morning, but for people in Europe, it was... 5 p.m., 6 p.m., so dinner time for them, which is the same time when we do the normal shows every week. So it worked out really well. I, you know, Normally we have about, say, 600 people join us for the Monday show, and there was about 450 Europeans who like were surprised that this was even happening. So uh, it worked out really well, and a lot of people had just like never caught one of the shows live, so it felt really good. So we're going to keep doing this. So we'll do one show a month, 
that's good for people in Europe, one show a month that's good for people in Asia and Australia and two shows a month that are good for people on in North America. And that's me. So uh, just be careful. We'll try to make it really clear in the thumbnail. But you know, when you see the upcoming shows, just pay attention to what time which which time stream uh, you're going to be joining. All right, we will see you next time.